Our topic for this session is pulmonary embolism. Our first case is a relatively straightforward case of vertebroplasty cement embolization. This is a well-known phenomenon and a common enough complication of this therapy. There are linear branching densities throughout both lungs in a pulmonary vascular distribution, and there is vertebroplasty cement with an extravertebral linear contrast density denoting the venous entry point for this contrast. On the cine, you can appreciate the many locations of dense contrast throughout both lungs. You can also again see that vertebroplasty cement and the extravertebral and venous cement. So that's a case of vertebroplasty cement embolization. Our next case is again relatively straightforward, a saddle embolism with right ventricular strain. There are extensive filling defects throughout the pulmonary arteries and bridging the pulmonary bifurcation here extending down into the lower lobes. There is also straightening of the inner ventricular septum with associated enlargement of the right ventricle and compression of the left ventricle. This, these are the exact findings of right ventricular strain that the emergency physicians of the entire country are now asking to have included in reports. So there are the filling defects and here the straightening of the septum and relative enlargement of and decrease in size of the right and left ventricles. So that's a case of saddle embolism with ventricular strain. Our next case, a pulmonary embolism with multifocal pulmonary infarcts. Again, the filling defects are present in multiple pulmonary arterial branches and there are multiple wedge-shaped peripheral regions of consolidation consistent with pulmonary infarcts. You see again filling defects in the lower lobes and you can also appreciate some interventricular septal straightening there also consistent with right ventricular strain. On the lung windows well demarcated peripheral consolidation again consistent with a pulmonary infarct. There are the filling defects and we'll let that run so you can appreciate their extent really are involving every major pulmonary arterial segment. Again, you can appreciate the right ventricular strain. And on the lung windows, here is the largest and perhaps best demonstrated pulmonary infarct. But again, these are multifocal. And in the left lower lobe, you can appreciate additional perhaps less classically appearing infarcts. So that's multifocal embolization with pulmonary infarcts. Our next case is an Eisenmenger syndrome resulting from an acute pulmonary embolism. This patient has a chronic ventricular septal defect and had massive volume overload and pulmonary hypertension throughout her pulmonary system. So there is huge enlargement of the pulmonary artery and there is extensive wall thickening and calcification throughout the pulmonary arterial system. Here in the inferior mediastinum, you're looking at the inferior aspect of the right pulmonary artery, again demonstrating that wall calcification and marked hypodense thickening. In the left lower lobe, there is a central filling defect consistent with an acute pulmonary embolism. Here you see the enlargement of the right atrium, which is pronounced, and the membranous septal, ventricular septal defect with nice demonstration of right to left shunting. You see the left atrium shows no contrast opacification, and the dense contrast of the right ventricle is passing directly into the left ventricle. 
So first appreciate the marked enlargement of the pulmonary arteries and that chronic wall thickening and calcification. Again, we'll look at the left lower lobe and that central filling defect, which has the appearance of an acute pulmonary embolism. Now let's look at the ventricular septal defect. You see again the dense contrast on the right passing to the left, representing a relatively acute right to left shunting, most likely resulting from the acute pulmonary embolism and an acute abrupt increase in pulmonary hypertension, exceeding the arterial pressure and allowing that opposite direction shunting to occur. Our next case is an atrial septal defect with paradoxical embolism. There is an unusually configured filling defect in the aortic arch itself, which you'll see in the movie extends actually up into the left subclavian as well. There are extensive filling defects throughout the pulmonary arteries And these findings obviously are linked. There is that left subclavian occlusion and the filling defect within the aortic arch itself. And now appreciate the filling defects throughout the pulmonary arteries. So this patient had bilateral pulmonary emboli, an abrupt increase in pulmonary pressure, and resultant right to left shunting. There actually is an increase in the size of the right heart structures here, a little more subtle than those we've seen, but present all the same, and possibly representing the chronic manifestations of an atrial septal defect. So this is again a case of pulmonary embolism causing an abrupt rise in pulmonary pressure and right to left shunting through a pre-existing septal defect. This being a case of ASD with paradoxical embolization. Our next case is a renal cell carcinoma with pulmonary embolism. There is a hypodense nodule in the right upper lobe, obviously concerning. There are hyalur hypodense nodes consistent with metastatic disease. And you see here the filling defect of a pulmonary embolism. Inferiorly, you have enough of the abdomen to pick up a hypodense heterogeneous renal mass extending into the right renal vein and inferior vena cava, a classic renal cell carcinoma with venous extension. So there is that hypodense mass, the filling defect, and our renal cell carcinoma extending through the renal vein and well into the IVC. You can see its hypodense filling defect extending all the way up almost to the right atrium, certainly to the level of the diaphragm. So that is a case of a renal cell carcinoma with acute presentation with pulmonary embolism. Our next case is endocarditis with septic emboli. I have many cases of septic embolization, but relatively few of them actually show the filling defect of an embolism. This, of course, is present to a great degree here in the right main pulmonary artery. On lung windows, you can see numerous small cavitary lesions, as well as airspace densities that are generally wedge-shaped, consistent with embolic infarcts. Lastly, there is a sizable vegetation here on the tricuspid valve. Note also there is marked right atrial enlargement, consistent with valvular incompetence. Here again is the filling defect in the right pulmonary artery extending down into the lower lobe. And on lung windows, multiple cavitary lesions, but most notably here in the right lower lobe. And this rather striking vegetation on the tricuspid valve. You can see the 
hepatic venous and IVC backflow consistent again with valvular incompetence. So that is a case of tricuspid endocarditis frequently associated with IV drug use and subsequent septic embolization. Our last case is infectious sacroiliitis with septic thrombophlebitis and septic emboli. The most important finding here is this semilunar hypodensity on the deep aspect of the iliacus muscle. Note it is immediately adjacent to the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint. This finding is seen in cases of septic sacroiliitis and is highly specific. In many such cases, the bone windows will be normal as they were in this case. In addition, in the internal iliac vein, there is a filling defect, which in this setting, I think, can easily be uh, interpreted as representing septic thrombophlebitis. On the inferior aspect of the sacroiliac joint, there is also a fluid collection extending here into the external rotators, and adjacent musculature. The lungs tell quite a story with cavitary lesions and fluid levels, all consistent with septic embolization and bringing the entire diagnosis together. So note that fluid collection on the deep aspect of the iliacus immediately adjacent to the anterior sacroiliac joint. Now on the more inferior aspect of the SI joint, you'll see another fluid collection extending out again into the external rotator musculature. Lastly, let's take a look at the filling defect in the internal iliac vein. And a final overall view of those extensive cavitary lesions. So, that is a case of infectious sacroiliitis with associated septic thrombophlebitis and septic emboli. And that concludes our session on pulmonary embolism.